Welcome to the Pace Center Pod, where we explore and reveal the perspectives, insights, and approaches to deliver great results and growth in your agribusiness through better execution. Here's your host, the Integration Pace Center, Joe Moser. Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Pace Center Pod. I am your host, Joe Moser. Thank you so much for choosing to spend your time with us today. We talk a lot about agribusiness strategy and growth in this program. But what we haven't spent enough time talking about is how do you manage risk that accompanies and is associated with the growth of your business? And so this week, I'm really excited to be joined by two industry experts, Fritz Waldorf and Scott Cornell of Lockton Global Insurance. These guys specialize within Lockton's food and agribusiness practice. They work directly with folks like yourselves, operators along the ag value and ag supply chains to properly understand, anticipate, and underwrite the different risks that you're faced with in the business. And today's interview covers a lot of really relevant ground. I think you're going to find a lot of value here. You know, the last couple of years, we've seen a lot of dislocation within the risk and underwriting space, including a lot of organizations experience sudden non-renewals as their underwriters and their risk and insurance partners leave that channel, leave that space. So Scott and Fritz are going to talk through why that's happening, how a concentration of risk actually creates more challenges for some of the operators in the space. They're going to talk about how the risk profile of growth is maybe underappreciated sometimes. Think about how much bigger, how much more complex your organization is. Think of the cost of construction and materials to rebuild that particular business. And is your insurance tracking from a cost perspective and an underwriting perspective those risks such that you're properly protected? They're going to talk about severe convective storms and some of the targeted impacts of severe weather within our industry. And they're going to talk about some of the things that you need to be thinking about from the universe of risk standpoint to ensure that Yes, you understand your risks, you've got the right insurance and protection in place, and that you've actually de-risked the future of your business. This is a great conversation with Fritz and Scott from Lockton, so let's jump over to the interview. Hey, Fritz and Scott, it's great to have you guys on the show at last. We've been working on scheduling this one for a while. Uh, lots going on as relates to risk and underwriting within the ag value chain space, so a highly relevant and impactful conversation for our listeners. So. Before we jump in, I just wanted to say thanks for making the time and welcome to the Pace Center Pod. Thank you, Joe. We appreciate it. Yeah, great to be here, Joe. Great. Well, let's just roll into this with maybe some uh, brief introductions of yourselves, the roles you play at Lockton, the work you do for folks along the ag value chain, and then maybe a little bit about Lockton more generally and the the agribusiness practice therein. Yeah, you bet. Thank you, Joe. I'll, I'll kick that off real quick. I'm Fritz Waldorf. I've been with Lockton for going on seven years now. My formal title is a producer. I focus exclusively in the food and agribusiness space. Fortunate to be with Lockton. Fortunate to work in this industry with all the individuals listening to this. Lockton's a family-owned insurance broker. We're top 10 in the world. Uh, more relatively unique, just given that size and a dedicated food and ag team. The company was started by Jack Lockton in 1966 and still family owned to this day. So thank you again, Joe. Great. Yeah, great. Joe, Scott Cornell, uh, been with Lockton for 18 years. I started Lockton right out of school and uh, joined uh, the fast track program that we have here at Lockton for new graduates and was placed in large national accounts. And there was a grain deal there. And that kind of goes back to the origin story of what we've built out here, a team that focuses exclusively on complex solutions for what we consider traditional agribusiness. And that's grain, seed, feed, fertilizer in the adjacent areas. Fantastic. That's exactly the folks we look to to speak to and work with in this show. So a lot of great synergy and overlap there. So bear with me for a bit of a, a, of a, a preamble here. But for those listening, I'm guessing that we're all familiar that over the last couple of years, we've been hearing about some turbulence in the insurance market, generally speaking. And even here recently, the New York Times did a a detailed study of impacts we're seeing in the home residential market, right? Conventionally, we've heard about folks in the coastal regions, Florida, Louisiana, uh, parts of California, where they've had difficulty or or outright inability to secure homeowners insurance. And the study or the, the investigation talked more about some of the dislocation in the insurance market for even residential properties in in Iowa, 
right? So even in the I states now, and some of that driven by weather events or other, other factors. But we're also seeing it specifically within certain segments of the ag value chain and, and the risks that are related to it. And I know probably here two years ago, there was uh, at least one case where a, a policyholder in the upper Midwest, a uh, grain origination supply chain operator, was scrambling to secure insurance related to their business and operations because their historical underwriter had chosen to exit that channel, right? So they were they were left with relatively short notice with uninsured operations, right? From an inventory standpoint, asset standpoint, and everything else. And so suddenly uh, can be quite destabilizing because suddenly something you took for granted, right? I can always buy home owner's insurance. I can always insure my business. Suddenly you're scrambling to figure out, okay, where, where do we go? And so I guess what I want to start off with you guys here today is, you know, what's going on here? Is this, are we moving off a, of a that generally secular curve where predictable rates in the past have been so thoroughly displaced that operators are just adjusting to this new risk landscape? Is this a deviation from historical claim activity that's making pricing risk really difficult for some underwriters? Is it that folks are looking to exit certain lines because they're trying to offset losses in other parts of their business? Or is there something specific about agribusiness that is troublesome for them? So a big question, but I think that's really going to be on the mind of all, a lot of our listeners. I'd love to hear what you guys have to say about that. Yeah, absolutely, Joe. You know, I think when you look at it, a lot of the issues that we're encountering in the traditional ag space or the ag space from an insurance perspective is tied back to the fact that there's such a limited marketplace. So when you talk about the the individual or the firm in the upper Midwest that had found themselves you know, uninsured, well, when you take an insurance company out of the mix and there's only three or four, you have a big concentration of it risk issue here where you know entire portfolios are are managed and handled by three or four insurance companies. So unlike the rest of the standard commercial insurance market, there's not a very large spread of risk and it's concentrated. So when you find yourself with a handful of markets and then you step back and you look at historically, these are organizations that have grown some tremendously and their portfolios have gotten to levels that might far exceed the capabilities of their insurance partners. And that's a whole nother issue. But when you look at rates and deductibles, those hadn't really moved to a sustainable level for the insurance carriers to make money for a long time. You know, the group that went out of business a couple of years ago or, or ceased operations, it had been 10 plus years since they had adjusted filed rates. And it, so it wasn't keeping up with the cost of construction trends, inflationary cost. So when I look at the big issue, it comes down to property and it comes down to in, inadequate rates and uh, inadequate deductible structures. And so without with three or four markets, lack of competition, you know, results in lack of creativity. And, and uh, you know, that's when you need to challenge yourself and you need to ask, why am I buying insurance this way? And challenge your partners because we look at things through a little bit slightly different lens. And that's how do you come up with solutions and, and challenge the status quo? And Joe, I'll add, I'll add one piece to that too. I think some of the pain that a lot of our clients and prospects are feeling comes after a market non-renews them or exits the space, what happens after that? And what we're seeing is there's just a flood of submissions into the markets that are still in this space, making their job much more difficult than it was historically. And so this concentration of risk, this, this lack of a, a diverse underwriting base, if, if we will, or insurance partner base, that sort of peak activity when folks roll, roll off renewal, right? We don't all share the same renewal calendars, but sometimes over time they tend to concentrate around certain times of the year, et cetera. It's driving a lot of that difficulty. So is there anything specific about the agribusiness industry specifically that's also creating headwinds? Meaning, I mean, we all know that agriculture is an outdoor sport and mother nature is the referee, right? So at the at the farm, there's there's a lot of risk there that that, that varies with just the, the weather forecast. But from a climate perspective, are ag businesses disproportionately exposed and that creates more challenges or is that pretty consistent across multiple industries from your perspective? So you look at it, 
And that article that you reference talking about homeowners insurance in Iowa, when you look at the risks that ag organizations are exposed to, you know, they're in the Midwest. I mean, that's where the bulk of these operations are. Sure, there's huge ag production in the coast California, but when you talk about the core traditional ag business of what we do, it is right here in the heartland of America. And what is driving a lot of these issues, and, and now it's even coming into the homeowners, is what they call severe convective storm. So SCS. It's our thunderstorms with straight line winds. It is tornado activity. And when you look at how insurers structure their insurance, you know, insurance companies buy insurance and they're, some of them are heavily reliant on their reinsurance partners. SCS or severe convective storm historically hadn't been loaded in as a charge for a premium load. And so now reinsurers are saying, look, we're taking huge hits on the secondary peril that we weren't necessarily charging for. And that we're, we're seeing that trickle down effect. And we saw that with a flash correction with the reinsurance market last year. And so for those you know, ag insurers that are heavily, heavily reliant on their reinsurance partners or have to restructure how they buy their insurance, that's all going to make its way down to, you know, our operator level. So that's SCS. That's going to be a common term. If, if folks aren't already familiar with it, severe convective storm is going to be driving changes to how their policies are structured. So we've seen over the last few years some really differing approaches on how you would handle the deductible levels for wind or severe convective storm. And frankly, we've even seen some uh, carriers bring to market uh, deductible structures that leave you almost self-insured for the wind peril. And so that's something that is on our radar and you know something that operators need to be really keeping a close eye out for us, how these deductible levels are coming in and how they're wording their wind hail deductibles because it could leave them in a position where they uh, are effectively self-insured for that peril, depending on how it's the bespoke wording is tailored. So just out of curiosity, we heard terms like, you know, a derecho event, which I think is an extreme, nearly hurricane strength, straight line wind. Does that fall into that SES type category? That was what really started highlighting a lot of these issues with the ag markets, the concentration of risk. So when we talk about concentration of risk, it's you know, when they look at what they're providing insurance for, what is that geographic spread? So does one of these markets have 85% of the grain or agronomy operations in a state? Well, they need to manage, you know, how they allocate, you know, where they're going to be exposed because a derecho comes through and cuts across the country from, you know, west to east. And I think it really highlighted the fact that, oh my, we need to reevaluate where and how much we insure in certain geographies. And that's a lot of that's driven from the reinsurance market too, because they'll look at and say, you're telling me that you're writing 80% of these assets you know, across four states. We're not going to be on board to keep the same structure in place for your insurance program to ABC insurer in the ag space. So Fritz, as, a, as I understand your role, the, the client facing the person that's going out there and, and winning the business, working with the customers, understanding their their needs, et cetera. You know, the customers, myself included, we love when you get your renewal and the rate is unchanged. But sounds like that also can create some long tail risk if over a period of time, as I think Scott said earlier, over a period of time, those are not adjusting the deductible structure or the underlying premium are not adjusting over time that may not be reflective of, the, of a static risk environment. You know, but so from your standpoint, how do we get into a situation where significant players, I'm asking us to dance in anyone's grave here, but how does it come to a situation where folks have failed to adjust the pricing of their products and services actually to the detriment of their business? Any insights there around how that comes to pass? Yeah, I think that's a great question because I think what we're looking at is actually a two-way street. And and I understand all of our clients and prospects' frustration. And I think it's easy to point the fingers at an insurance carrier. But realistically, I think a lot of our clients and prospects also have maybe a little bit of a a, a duty or responsibility to also meet in the middle with these carriers, right? We want them to be prosperous. We want our clients to be prosperous. We want everyone to remain in the space. So it brings longevity to people's programs. And 
you know, we hear a lot of pain about deductibles coming up and we know that's painful for our clients and I'm not dismissing that. But how can we think creatively, come to a better middle ground on things like deductibles where you are taking a little more risk? You know, one thing that's huge right now is valuations. And there's a lot of investment going into all the assets in the space. They're highly sophisticated facilities and carriers are also having to take a deeper dive into valuations and and have different companies look at that. So it's not just a rate question, it's a valuation question. and, And how do you tackle both of those at one time? Poorly executed mergers and acquisitions destroy more value than they create. They can set your company back years. To defend your firm's position in the marketplace, you need access to the leading practices that unlock the greater potential of your people, processes, and systems. If you are undertaking a company transformation or pursuing an acquisition as a vehicle to grow, set up a call with Joe by visiting www.mosherecg.com. Yeah, it's very well said. You know, I think about we live in, in northern lower peninsula, Michigan, and as in many places in the country, a, a very hot residential market, right? Lots of people that uh, want to live here, a lot of, lots of folks with money that now are choosing to make this their primary residence as opposed to a summer vacation home. And insurance costs have gone up, or not insurance costs, but construction costs, time and materials and, and all those things. Building materials have all gone up so dramatically that I know there's been a number of us in the community that have occurred to us that if your house burns down, is your coverage actually adequate to rebuild where you're at. And so there's been some of us that have to have proactively asked that question because you look at the square footage of your house and you know, looking at something that used to be $300 a square foot to build now pushing 450, 475. It doesn't, you know, you don't have to be a math major to figure out that your coverage is probably going to fall short of rebuilding what you got. And so I think that's an important lesson too for folks thinking about the growth of their business, not just your business is growing in terms of value and scale of operations, but the underlying cost to replace that business that is significantly bigger than it was five, 10 years ago. And perhaps it's a reminder, if, if you're not seeing your insurance uh, partner reach out and ask questions about your business, if you're not seeing some adjustments in your underlying insurance costs, that you know probably feels like a relief in the moment, but it might be an indication you need to ask some questions because you certainly don't want to get in a situation where your, your partner's asleep at the wheel. Well, that's kind of the worst surprise, right? You know, you go through a loss and at the end of the day, your insurance is not what you thought it was after paying such high premiums. And I think that's so much of our role and our job and our competitors' roles and our competitors' job is to make sure clients know what they are purchasing and what risk they are holding on to because they're very, very complicated policies and and making sure what is there when you need it is is key. So let's uh, pan back then from that displacement and readjustment in the insurance space. And we started talking about this with some of the uh, the SCS topics there, Scott, earlier, but talking generally about the risk universe, one of the reasons I wanted to have you both in the show is to help us think differently or at least more comp- comprehensively about the universe of risks that agribusinesses face. You know, there's always the conventional risks we talked about, you know, weather events, fire, someone slipping on ice in the parking lot, it wasn't much ice this last winter up here, but you know it's conceivable it could happen. But what else beyond those conventional risks should folks be thinking about? You know, are there emerging or underappreciated exposures that agribusiness operators need to keep an eye on? Yeah, I mean, so when you break it down, you look at sure there's emerging risks that we keep an eye on. There's things on the horizon that we can talk about, but outside of property, the next, the largest risk when you look at these operations. You know, typically we're dealing with very large fleets in this space to move things around from facility to facility or to hubs, or if they stepped away from managing a very large fleet, because a number of years ago you would say, gosh, auto premiums are getting so high. Uh, What's a, you know, risk mitigation tactic to deploy here? So we're going to downsize our fleet and we're going to outsource all of our loads to third-party haulers. Well, auto, at the end of the day, now it doesn't matter if it's your own vehicle, or a third-party hauler contractor. Auto is the next biggest risk that we find these folks facing. And in turn, it's becoming, uh, depending on fleet size or, or the volume of utilization of third-party haulers, it's, it's you know second or third on their total cost of risk spend. 
And that's because of, hey, we're operating heavy trucks. Sometimes we're in rural areas. Sometimes we might come across a very tough uh, jurisdiction. That's all taken into consideration when these underwriters are looking at how to price your auto. And I'm speaking you know, specifically to auto liability, not your physical damage. And so, hey, there's these nuclear verdicts out there. If you find yourself in a judicial hellhole, and we call those you know, things like Cook County, Illinois, Jackson County, Missouri, places that hey, you know that that is not something where you want to take something to trial just because of how things operate and how things function in those jurisdictions. You have litigation funding that is uh, really coming into play here. Litigation funding might not be common uh, knowledge to, to folks in this space, but what Uh, these firms are doing is they're coming up behind someone that's a plaintiff that's suing your company and say it was a catastrophic auto accident. They are funding them. They're buying basically the settlement from them and they'll keep them afloat and have the rights to call it 50, 70, whatever percentage of the final settlement. And so there's no, hey, you know, time has passed, mediation, let's settle this. No, these litigation funding firms are saying, no, we're taking this one to trial and, uh, you know, we bought half the rights to this settlement. So auto and, you know, how the plaintiff's bar is operating in this space is really the next biggest spend or exposure that we find our folks facing. So you, there's a secondary market for folks that want to be professional turners of the thumbscrew who can come in and basically take a position in someone else's claim. Yeah, how is this legal? <laughs> it blows my mind. When I heard about this, you know, six, seven, eight years ago, I was like, surely someone's going to, there's going to be some sort of reform to shut this down. It just doesn't seem right. And uh, it's a very lucrative business and it continues to drive up uh, the total cost of these claims. And Joe, when you look at the rate adequacy issue that Scott was talking about on the property with the auto piece coming into conversation here and that kind of being a second area of real pain, that's having a direct impact on umbrella pricing and excess liability that all of our clients, they have a significant risk. And so the pricing has been dramatic for them in those areas because most likely because of their auto fleet. Oh, okay. So property, fleet, litigation funding, Hmm. general umbrella policies, anything, any comments or, or insights around inventory, risk for some of the people that keep very large raw or finished product positions throughout the year, cyber risk. Mm -hmm. What else have people been thinking about? Yeah, I mean, so inventory, cyber is a big concern. The other thing is the other big hot topic uh, to keep a pulse on is, you know, where you sit in the supply chain uh, for ag chem. Okay, so ag chemicals, dicamba, glyphosate, Paraquat, those, depending on where you sit in that supply chain, if you're a manufacturer, you're basically going to be self-insuring that exposure for those specific targeted chemicals. If you are a wholesaler, a ag retailer, a distributor, you can still buy meaningful umbrella excess liability towers, you know, hundred, two hundred million dollars without any specific exclusions because of the nature that, hey, you can continue. Any claim that comes in for these, they're being tendered back to Monsanto, Bayer, and accepted for now. But need to keep a a pulse on what happens with that litigation and what the insurer's stance is so that you don't wake up one morning with a ag chem exclusion for dicamba, glyphosate, paraquat on your GL and umbrella policies. So that's something to keep a pulse on. Inventory stock, Yes, you know, weather is is quite unpredictable. You know, it's structuring those programs that you can have meaningful flood, quake coverage. You know, the Missouri River flooding from a couple years ago highlighted the need to make sure that bulk storage static stock had adequate values. And, you know, not to be a commercial for Lockton, but that is an area that we created a facility with all those coverages for inventory that is covered anytime, anywhere, warehouse to warehouse, on the river, on the ocean, and provides full flood and quake. And and we're in year two and have doubled the capacity there and have, have structured it with the right partners, the right players, and the right marketplace. When you were mentioning there a couple of minutes ago around, you know, dicamba, glyphosate, things like that, are, are we talking about 
that's that's ensuring the risk from a, an adverse condition from human health exposure standpoint. So someone has a has a claim that they've developed some sort of a health related issue from exposure. That's uh, for folks that are listening. Scott's nodding his head, so I'm. I'm yes. it sounds like that's what that was. Okay. Yes. Well, and that Joe, and and the straight exclusions that we've seen proposed is not only for the bodily injury, but it's also for the misapplication property damage that would result if you are out in the field spraying that. And typically, hey, you have cover. You know, if there was a contaminated take tank, or if there was some overspray for dicamba that hit a crop that wasn't dicamba ready. That too, all that exposure that you currently have coverage for would be excluded when they start slapping these uh, ag chem exclusions on your your liability policies. So how about here recently? So we're recording this in the in the spring of 24. I'm not going to name products or chemicals or manufacturers, but there's been some select chemical, some select agronomic chemistry products that have been, you know, you can no longer sell and apply uh, due to federal regulation requirements. And there was some clarifications from the EPA allowing folks that had pre-purchased or had in inventory the ability to apply through this year, right? But there's not always the guarantee that a federal decree or federal judgment or ruling on a particular chemistry is going to allow folks that have prepaid or taken delivery who maintain big positions are going to have that. So is that an insurable risk? Are there products out there for folks who are saying, you know, we're We've got signals that perhaps parts of our chemical portfolio, we could have the rug effectively pulled. And how do we ensure the insure <laughs> or mm-hmm. ensure, I guess, that we're not sitting on a bunch of unusable, unsellable product because of a, of a late, from a seasonal standpoint, a late, a late stage decision saying that can no longer be put on XYZ crop or within this jurisdiction or within whatever. Yeah, you know, in- that's a tough spot, Joe. And, for that product that falls outside of the time range that they've given them for, you know, June for cotton or whatever those dates were uh, with those pr- select products, that unused inventory, that's unfortunately not an insurable risk or there's not any product that folks would have in place that would, would help them out there. So that is a, a really, you know, unfortunate situation that some of these regulators will, could be putting folks in. Well, as we start to think about wrapping up today, you know, I can keep peppering you with all the different uh, edge cases that I have, and I'm not sure it's always additive to the <laughs> listeners, so I'm going to fight my urge here. But as we think about wrapping up, I want to make sure that we we move this discussion past the, well, that was interesting mm-hmm. phase and actually provide the listeners with some concrete, actionable recommendations. And I think there's a couple of things that have already come out here today. One is simply, you know, gut checking. If you haven't gotten a premium adjustment or a deductible adjustment in the last couple of years, start asking yourself, why might that be? It's not universally good news. You know, another one being the growth of our business is not just showing up in the P&L, yeah. but is also showing up perhaps in a risk profile that's no longer reflective of the coverages we have in place. So it's clearly some a need to look look in the mirror there. And then a couple other things here as well. But, you know, what else would you all be encouraging our listeners, operators, owners, executives of ag value and ag supply chain companies in the U.S., what would you be encouraging them to think about here uh, as we look to off-ramp? Yeah, that's a great question, Joe, and I, I think you nailed it. I think we've touched on a lot of pain points here. I think we have a lot of excitement about the future and what's to come. When we look at the macroeconomics of the insurance market right now, we are seeing some pretty favorable market conditions, particularly over in London and just globally in general. Typically, those are the markets that lead the wave of either a firm market or a soft market. So I know Scott and I have been on a handful of different trips over to London this year to meet with the underwriters that we've got great relationships with. And we're starting to see a little more competition in property. And for a lot of the listeners that may have a a domestic ag carrier placement on property, I can't tell you exactly how that's going to impact you. But I, I do think things are looking a little bit better on the horizon. So hopefully that's a good thing for everyone listening. And I also think that uh, these difficult market times have allowed for more creative thinking and, okay, how do we build something that's sustainable? How do we look to the future? What do the market dynamics look like today versus 20 years ago? And how do we react to that? So as painful as things are now, I, I would argue, and Scott can chime in here, but I think we're pretty excited about the future and hopefully making these market conditions that everyone is experiencing a lot better. 100%. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm excited. I'm optimistic. You know, we're 
in the process of continuing to create different solutions for our, our clients and folks in this space with uh, respect to property solutions that fall outside of the traditional ag insurance market. It's based on the size and scale of these organizations, these ag companies, where we really get to shine is helping them change the way they think about buying insurance. Folks have sat there and through mergers or acquisitions, you know, they've become half billion dollar companies, billion dollar companies. And that premium has just kind of grown and, and scaled and hasn't been right sized or challenged to, to see how you can buy it differently. You know, when we see clients with a couple million dollar spend and, you know, a couple million dollar losses each year and it just keeps going up and up and up, it's hidden pause, bringing in the tools, the resources and looking at these as true complex placements, bringing in the global marketplace and then tailoring a, a solution that is mutually beneficial, as Fritz touched on earlier, where it's sustainable, it's a partner for your client, and you know it's it can be a profitable account uh, for the insurance market. And it, it gives you that insurance where you're retaining the attritional losses and you're laying off the catastrophic losses, uh, whether that's on casualty or property. So very optimistic and excited and, you know, just need to continue to bring solutions to folks in this marketplace that operate in a very low margin sector that can't have the volatility of, you know, 20, 25, 30, 45% increases every year from their insurance company. Yeah, low, thin margins, capital intensive, already carry enough natural exposure to the weather and, and global S&Ds. And so it's, I, I think that's well said. Um, and as we, as we wrap up here too, I think this, you know, I'm happy to hear that we're perhaps seeing the other side of this turbulent period we've been through, right? And that the the industry is adjusting. It's it's not meant to minimize or dismiss the pain, the very real pain that's been felt by operators, underwriters, and everyone in between. But we, we do know that moments of crisis and pain do have a, a clarifying effect. And sometimes you come out of it, survive it a, a bit stronger and certainly a, in a more acute uh, and sharp sense of, of what the market is actually presenting you with. You know, we've certainly seen that, you know, coming out of the pandemic, companies were able to drive some pretty dramatic efficiencies in how they organize their teams, how they secure the talent that they need to run their businesses, how they manage their supply chains, how they price their products. I mean, it, it, it's unfortunate you have to go through these periods of pain to get to that, but it, it's good to hear it sounds like in, in the insurance space, that's also something we're experiencing here as well. We'll come, return, come out of it stronger than before and uh, certainly a lot longer on knowledge and experience. Absolutely. Fantastic. Well, guys, thanks for taking the time again and joining us and being part of the Pace Setter Pod. We'll make sure that we have your contact information in the show notes so folks that are listening can get in touch with you and learn more about Lockton if, if they're so inclined. So just thank you to you both. And also thank you to our listeners for tuning in today. A reminder to like and subscribe to the Pace Setter Pod on your device right now. And if you're so inclined, please leave us a review. It helps us get the word out. And if you want to continue the conversation, you can connect with me, Joe Moser, on LinkedIn or set up a call by visiting Moser Consulting Group online at mosercg.com. Thanks for listening and have a safe day. This is the podcastfactory.com.